Good evening, everybody. I want to take this time to, I'm Sheriff Gary Hoffman, and we'll all introduce our panelists up here, but I want to take this time to welcome everybody and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules for a topic that is uh, very important to us, and obviously you all as parents, very important to you. So it means a lot that everybody came out. I wanted to say that this group is not sponsored by the Sheriff's Office, DES, the Board of Education. This is concerned administrators, concerned leaders that want to come together um, in a town hall forum to hear input from the community and to discuss what the concerns and needs and ideas are that you have. And we want to share some things with you that we're doing as well. With that being said, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Dr. Salines. And good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for taking an opportunity to come out, like Sheriff said, um, for a very important topic for our community as a whole. And I think that's what we need to really focus on, that this, is, this isn't just a school issue or a school problem or a school topic. This is something that is for our entire community that we need to come together and create a forum where we can have an open discussion um, so we can always do better. Um, I think we do great, but we can always do better. And so um, just welcoming this opportunity to engage with everyone. I'm Lieutenant Laramore, Centerville Police. Appreciate the opportunity to come out. Um, like you said, it's a uh, topic that not only concerns law enforcement and first responders, but also the community. I mean, not just this community, but it's a topic that faces our, our nation as a whole. And uh, we want to get in front of it and prepare the best that we can. Good evening. My name's um, Assistant Chief Lauren Morris from, and I'm here representing Queen Anne's County Emergency Services. Um, I currently am in charge of the Emergency Management Division, so I work with these fellows up here to develop any kind of plans or any strategies on how we're going to combat this problem. So. Um, I'm looking forward to working with them. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. My name is Joe Saborian, the uh, coordinator of school security and safety. I'm about three weeks in. I've uh, been making my rounds uh, at the various schools uh, and introducing myself, attending some of the drills that are already underway. Um, I have a very long tenured connection with law enforcement and, uh, and, and our emergency services, uh, and I'm looking forward to working hard to ensure that our schools uh, continue to remain safe. Good evening. <clears throat> Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Um, before Mr. Sabori came along, uh, school safety and security fell under me. We're very fortunate to have the relationships that we have with the Sheriff's Department, Centerville PD, Maryland State Police, and DES. But having Mr. Sabori on board will take us to the next level of having you know, someone dedicated to that. I think. For most of us sitting up here, if you're looking at the school aspect, I have two daughters in school. All right, Mr. Sabori, uh, Ms. Morris, we all have students in here, so it is something that you know is very near and dear to our hearts because there is that connection there with that. So, if I could interrupt uh, QAC TV, we're getting text messages. That's how accessible we are from the public that there's no sound. So, okay. they are working on it. Does that mean we have to do that all over again? <laughs> I think they're going to have closed captioning for part of this. So, what I want to open up the other process, thank you. Yeah, sure. Prodding me here. Um, you have cards on your seats, and there are plenty of extra cards. Um, if anybody wants uh, to ask a question, or, or you can do it live if you'd like, but if you'd like to also submit the question to us, uh, we'd like to also respond back to everyone's questions on one giant email as well, so everybody has the same answers to all the questions. If you would submit those to Carrie, um, <laughs> Carrie will make sure that, uh, one, we answer the question, but two, that we also include that on the email distribution back to all of you for the questions that are asked. Um, and there are Sheriff's Office. Um, Hold on, we have a question. Can Absolutely, it's fine. Yep, thank you. Okay, so we'll just start the process of, um, I think we just wanted to talk a little bit about what we currently do. Um, and I'm gonna focus obviously from the perspective of the school district, um, since I'm the superintendent and I work very closely with the Sheriff's Department and the emergency services um, to provide training for our staff members, 
um, all different types of level of training. Um, and I will have to say that prior to COVID, um, we were on a very good, um, we had completed a lot of different trainings. Um, we had really gotten to a point where we, um, you know, looked at it from the perspective of how do we keep a bad guy out of our buildings and um, talked about all those strategies. And then COVID hit and our focus switched to social distancing, to um, trying to navigate the waters of COVID um, in our schools. And so 100% um, admit that um, that safety thought in our brains was pushed to the back. And so as we ended the last school year um, and working with our partners, we said we have to push school safety back up to the front of our plate and we have to do some retraining and so we started that this summer. We had some uh, intensive training for our administrators, and now we're currently doing school-to-school -school trainings. A big shift and move for our district specifically was hiring um, Joe in his position of school safety. Um, his experience level that he brings to the table, he helped to develop a lot of our plans um, prior to his position. So being able to know what goes into a safety plan, how to coordinate that um, with emergency services and all of your other partners, law enforcement included, um, he has that knowledge base. So we're getting back to that. He's um, doing needs assessments as we um, as he travels from building to building, and I'll let him go into additional detail. But creating that position within the district uh, shows our priority. And we just concluded our strategic plan, and one of our five goals was safety. And Joe's position was one of our um, you know, ways to, um, to complete our objectives of creating safe spaces for our students and our staff members in our school buildings, in all of our buildings, not just our schools, but at our central office as well, and our annex buildings and such. So um, I'm going to pass it on and, and share and let Sheriff share what he's doing. So who would have, first I wanted to uh, thank uh, Joe Sabori, the staff that's up here, Center for PD, Lori Morris, Sid. Um, we have a great team that's up here. Who would have thought, you know, a few years ago that we would be sitting here talking about school security, um, critical incidents in the workplace, church shootings, and things like that in our community? And when we look at different things that have occurred around the nation, one of the things that we have to understand is that we have a population of 50,000. Some of those jurisdictions had populations of six, 8,000 people, and critical incidents happened there. So we would be putting our head in the sand if we didn't think this would happen here in Queen Anne's County. And with all these partners here putting their heads together, the input from the community, our number one goal was to protect the kids, the young lady here, the other children that are in the room, when you're in that school environment to make you feel safe. I can't imagine what you all go through every day when you hear a book drop, a door slam, or something like that in that school, and the teachers, and the faculty, and the staff. You know, we've kind of been programming ourselves uh, for an incident to happen. Our goal with, up here as a team is to prevent that from happening. As a community, one of the things from law enforcement that we need from the community is to not be afraid to report what you see, what you hear, or what you know that shows up on social media, or word of mouth on the bus, or anything that you even speculate is going to happen. We depend on all of you. There are more community members in this room as the eyes and ears than there are law enforcement in this community or board members that are up here. And we really rely on all of you and getting that information to us in a really quick and timely fashion. We have school resource officers that cover all the schools in Queen Anne's County. And of course, one of the things with that is, you know, we've worked with the schools to ensure that, and we've got a great partnership here, that doors are being secured, staff is being trained to not prop doors open, Law enforcement is being trained to check those doors and make sure that those are hardened targets, that somebody can't get in to victimize our children. So a lot of work has gone into that, but we really rely on the community to report that to us. Um, there's an app out there for the Office of the Sheriff that you can download. It links you right to Maryland Safe Schools. You know, we're asking that don't rely on some other parent to report something that they think is suspicious. So many times in a critical incident, the news media goes around and they interview the neighbors of the kid that did the incident or the adult that did the incident. And they're all like, 
I knew that person was crazy. I knew something was going to happen someday. someday. I knew they were going to do this. We're depending on all of you to let us know that long before it ever gets to that point. We'd rather have it be nothing. We'd rather do the home visits and make the check than we would be as first responders, fire, EMS, law enforcement, other community members responding to a critical incident. And I truly believe that we can prevent that if we share information. Is that okay? Guess I'm up. Um, so with this role uh, as the coordinator of school safety and security, one of my priorities is um, visiting each school. And within the last two and a half weeks, I've been to several of our, our schools and uh, as an observer and, and witnessed some of their lockdown drills and some of their fire drills. Um, and what's most important to me is meeting with the people who are protecting our kids. Uh, and as Mr. Pender said, I have two kids in schools. One is at, at a high school, uh, and I apologize in advance to his teachers. <laughs> and uh, the other goes to a middle school here in the county. Uh, so to me, it's not just about picking up uh, where I left off, but it's about, you know, I have that, that additional layer that many of you have sitting in here in front of us. Um, so a priority to me is meeting with the, with the school staff and you know typically we walk around with the principals and vice principals um, today I was down at Mattapique Elementary School for their lockdown drill and I wanted to witness what it's like to be on the other side of the door when that uh, call for the lockdown or evacuation goes in because that's a completely different set of lenses that a lot of us have seen uh, so it's important to experience that and also to communicate with those educators, the front office staff, the custodians and cafeteria workers to find out what their needs are, what their training needs are, and what their physical security needs are to make sure that we have an obligation to keep those facilities safe. Uh, and then finally, um, a priority of mine is to continue to work with our law enforcement agencies to make sure that they have the most up-to-date response training and that they're equipped in case there's a critical incident. Um, so those are my priorities coming into this, looking at our policies, looking at our procedures, looking at our reunification locations, looking at physical security measures at each school. Uh, and if it's broken, we're going to fix it. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, and I'm looking forward again to working with all of the partners. And that's what that's what makes this great. Um, we, you know, I think law enforcement as a whole does a great job responding to a critical incident. Um, our focus and my focus as we go around to the schools throughout the next several months and several years is to focus that shift because I think, you know, we do a good job at keeping people safe, but really the focus has got to be stopping these types of attacks before they happen and identifying pre-attack indicators and making sure that we have great relationships, not just with department heads of police departments or emergency services, but we've got relationships with you, with parents and students. Because certainly the students are gonna to talk to one another and they're gonna to talk to their teachers or their bus driver. The bus drivers are the best detectives that are employed by the, by the school system because they're the ones that clean up the buses out at, at, at the end of each day and pick up all the trash and all the paper and they hear all the conversations. So um, we've got to really tap into those resources and establish some ways to make sure that we have great communication, uh, again, not just with our, with our community leaders, but with you know, the eyes and ears within the school. So, uh, and I'm, I am always available. Um, to be reached at the Central Office Board of Education if anyone ever wants to reach out to me directly with a question, anonymous or not, um, or you have an idea or something that maybe I haven't thought of, um, you know, there's a lot of experience out here, so I, I welcome any type of conversation. We can go grab a, grab a bite to eat um, and, and have a great conversation. So if you have concerns, questions, remarks, or things that we can do better, or things that you think we can do better, I'm all ears whatever it takes to keep these kids safe, to keep our staff safe. So, thanks.
as Mr. Sabori was saying, um, it's, to me it's a multi-layer approach. You know, you have to have the physical aspect of it, then you have the human aspect of it, and then you have the mental health portion of it. And it's connecting all of those dots together to make sure that one dot is not missed. Um, I can tell you, just in Mr. Sabori's brief time of being there, you know, we bounce ideas off of each other along with all of us. Um, but it, it's a different lens that he's looking through. Um, and when DES comes out in the Sheriff's Department, you know, teachers teach. You know, they didn't get into this profession to um, see some of the things that we're seeing nowadays. But that's part of life, and, you know, we have to adapt to that. Um, and some of the areas that we can talk about are the physical um, aspects of the school. And I will say that the, the um, county commissioners have been very generous uh, helping us, assist us with, um, you know, updating some of the stuff in our schools, along with the uh, Maryland Center for School Safety um, that uh, has several grants. Some of the items that you may have seen, we have A phones at all the main entrances so that we can talk to and communicate with um, the public before they get in there. We have single point entries at most of our schools. We still have plans where we're going through um, to upgrade the ones that do not have them. Um, that's, to us is very important. We have badge access controls um, where we can, you know, set somebody's time on there to come in for a certain time period. We're trying to do away with the keys that are out there. Um, we have really have a robust um, security camera system. It, about eight years ago, we had the system, there's about probably six or seven different systems. Everything now is IP based. Um, Mr. Sabori, myself, the principals can be at any kind of laptop. As long as we have internet, we can pull up those security cameras. And I'll say one of the great features that we have, and it's been a lot of help with uh, Lori Smith here, is we are on MView. So if you're not familiar with that, if we have an incident, MVU allows us, well actually allows DES, the Sheriff's Department, to take over our cameras so that they can view real time what's going on within the school during incident. There's, I'm only aware of about four other school systems in the state um, that have that capability. So that's one area that we're, um, you know, very proud of. The um, other area we're working on is we need some, uh, and the county commissioners have been very generous with this, cell phone boosters um, within our schools. And you're going to say, well, why do you need a cell phone booster in there? Because really, you know, when something happens, the teacher's not going to be stuck at the desk. You know, they're going to be out and about. They're either going to run, hide, or fight. Um, with that being said, they're not going to have that laptop right there with them. Having the cell phone actually gives us a point for reunification process to go through, and also, you know, the paper copy of our plans, that is on a um, Navigate 360. School today watching the lockdown drills, giving suggestions on how we can make it better, how we can make it safer. Um, while a lot of, of the people at this table are responsible for prevention, as an EMS responder, we're, we do more of the response. And how can we make that more efficient? How can we make sure um, that we have access to the buildings, that we can get in and get to where we need to be and know where we're going? That's where the MVU cameras come in. Um, we work with the dispatch center. They're, they're within my department as well um, to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, so that is one of the responsibilities that we have at DES is not just primary EMS response, but also that planning portion. Good evening. Like uh, the sheriff said and everybody else on the panel has said, our number one concern, um, you know, at Centerville Police is the safety of the students as well as the faculty. You know, we want to ensure that when your student leaves in the morning that they are returning home safely in the evening. Um, we've taken several steps to uh, ensure that I'm sure any of you that have dropped off recently at Kennard Elementary or Centerville Elementary, you've been out by the high school or middle school, you've seen our officers there during the morning times and also during the pickup times. Um, you know, the visual deterrent goes a long way. We've also participated in the lockdown drills at Centerville Elementary. Um, you know, we've made suggestions and um, those suggestions over the years have been put into place and it's helped harden the security at the schools. 
you know, we work in conjunction with the sheriff's office and um, you know other entities to ensure the safety of the students. Our officers are constantly in training for active shooter training, um, you know, first responder type training, medical emergency type training, things of that nature. Should we end up in a situation that you know we've seen on the TV too many times, you know, everybody thinks that it it may not happen in their community, but um, you know we always think of the the higher profile shootings that we've seen, but. You know, take you back a few years to the shooting at the Amish school. You know, nobody thought that that would have ever happened there. So I think we're in the um, we're on the right side of the fence with this, and and taking steps to move forward as a community, and move forward as law enforcement first responders to uh, take the initiative and get in front of this. Like the sheriff said, and uh, Mr. Sabori said, if anybody ever you know has a suggestion or has a question or has a tip, it can remain anonymous. Just pick the phone up and give us a call. If you happen to think that you heard something but you're not sure if it's important, please pick the phone up and give us a call. What may not seem important to you may be very, very important in the uh, larger scheme of things. And you know we would rather address it and it be nothing than to you know let it go aside and, and turn out to be you know, a catastrophe that we, we don't want to see. Um, and like I said, you know, we're, we're available anytime, you know, please, please feel free to pick us up, give us a call if you have a concern. Listen to your students, talk with your students when they get off the bus. I mean, they hear a lot of things that go on on the bus. It may be nothing, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's perfectly fine, but you know, your students are a wealth of information. You know, please take the time to talk to them and, and hear their concerns. So I think we've heard from all of the panel and now we're going to open it up for our questions. So if you do have a question, you can write it down and give it to Carrie. Or you can just raise your hand. We can pass out the microphone. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for having this here so we could all come have an open discussion. Um, talking about being proactive, um, one of the biggest things that I've seen, so was on July 19th, um, I was at Churchill Elementary all day for the primaries. And for 12 hours, I went into the bathroom, I'd say four or five times. Every time I walked into that bathroom, someone's child who was attending summer school at Churchill Elementary was in the bathroom with me unsupervised. And as a parent, if I knew that there was people walking in off the street, going into a bathroom with my child, I, I would be livid, as well as I'm sure everybody sitting here and you guys as well. Um, I, one of the biggest things was why, were, why was school in session that day? I mean, there was, I didn't see any school resource officers. Um, there was no sheriff's office. There was no MSP. And anybody could have walked right in off the street and they had the voting on one side and there was open classrooms right on the other side. So, I mean, anything could have happened. And the biggest thing was, uh, you know, people's kids using the bathroom. And it's just one of those things, did nobody think about this? Um, you know, so stuff like that, I think everybody needs to get a little bit more prepared and proactive and um, just work together. Because, I mean, like, do you, do you guys have any is anybody working on something like that? Or was that thought of, you know, that school was in session that day and hundreds of people were walking in off the street and using the bathroom with people's children. So um, that was, I mean, definitely where people could have done a lot better in that situation. So that was it. So I won't, uh, I won't give you any excuses for, for that. Um, one of the things I can tell you is we had a lot of deputies out during the election thing because there were a lot of issues going on, and that's clearly a point that we missed. And um, I'll take ownership for the law enforcement side of that. I can't attest or speak for other agencies as to why or if they were even making patrol checks. But I will definitely, I made notes here, and I will make sure that when, we, when there are open events like that or when we have elections being held or things like that, that we will make sure that uh, we work hand in hand with the Board of Education from the Sheriff's Office side um, to make sure that the kids are secure in those schools. And that's probably planning with the election board, making sure that people don't have access to other sides of the building, as well as having law enforcement there. 
I'm not going to give you any excuses. I've just taken notes on what you said. So, you're welcome. kids use certain bathrooms or maybe having the kids on different ends of the hallways or you know having somebody there like a school resource officer or an officer at all times because I mean any number of things could happen I just was kind of I was appalled every time I went to the bathroom you know there was kids in there and I'm they don't know I don't know them they don't me and if they were my you know somebody found out you know that lived in Churchill was like wait there's complete strangers and that were just walking in off the street to vote with my kids, you know, I would have been livid. So certain things like that, just, oh, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I was just going to say, first of all, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I want parents to be able to feel like during that moment that at any time, please feel free to go to the administration. Obviously a misstep on our part as well. Um, primaries, we don't think of them as same as a voting day. Um, and we've actually been working to be able to move those voting opportunities outside of, of the school, like and put them at firehouses and things like that so we wouldn't have a conflict. Um, we are working on that direction, but completely a misstep on our part and we really appreciate it. But I would just encourage that at that very moment when you have a concern, that's why our administrators are there. Please speak up and then that could be remedied right away. But definitely something that we have taken note on and will absolutely address and we appreciate you bringing it to our attention. All right, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Christine Gromley. Um, my concern, and I wrote it down on a comment card, um, has to do with the nine portables that are not, quote, secure in a building. Um, from my military <laughs> reserve training, um, my concern to those nine portables is they are without a barrier fence to block them from any walk up from a parking lot. Um, no offense against um, sheriff and police cars that are on premise in the morning, um, but I have myself as a parent been able to walk among students before the bell rings and have not been approached or questioned as to why I'm there, whether I'm dropping off a lunch or not. Or not. Um, my commentary to that is um, the portables are blind wall. In other words, there's no window to the parking lot side. So if a shooter or a stranger was to walk up, um, those uh, portable classrooms are tool shed sorry, no offense, they're glorified, um, with air conditioning and heating, um, but there is nowhere to duck and cover. There's no steel plate ribbon, even if they drop to the floor and hope that you all are pretty quick on their response. Um, if that AR-15 is still shooting bullets, um, it is a Swiss cheese and a no way to escape. Um, I would like to know if there's going to be any, um, when you do your lockdowns, if there is any way to um, more secure the open bar soft target that they are, because there's no barrier and those portables are basically a uh, mass grave box. Um, when you get done, those kids had nowhere to go, even if they were able to duck and cover the floor. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, that is one area that we have identified. Um, there's a couple of different issues um, with fencing. One, yes, there needs to be some barricades around there because anybody could drive up there, um, along with fencing that needs to go. We have taken a look at another school system that did something similar um, and constructed that. Again, we're just kind of in the planning phase for that and allocating the money for that, but it is something that is on our radar. Um, again, I have two daughters that attend out there at the portables, so. I have prior um, Lions that graduated and they've always hated those portables. <laughs> um, but um, the question would be in concerns to how, when you do your lockdown drills and the um, shooter intruder drills, how are the portables um, there's nine of them, so that's nine teachers and however many students we can put in there for classes during the day. How are they secured at all, like, to run? Like, when you all show up on scene, you're moving, you're moving as many students as you can out of the way, but how do those students, where do those students go if your building is secured with badge and door lock 
that took care of the other 1,100 and some odd, but that you've got about 150, maybe 200 students if they're all full at 20 plus a piece times nine, like the, do the math, the math comes out to like a couple hundred um, if they're all full. Um, how does that work in an active shooter trying to move people and get a hold of the guy with the gun? Like there's a lot of open ground um, with no barrier. Yeah, yeah, getting barriers up to like where would their duck and cover be? Um, my daughter is a sophomore and she attends an honors math class out in one of those. And even she doesn't know like if the bullets fly, like which way do we run, even if we can get out of the box. That. So, so I'll just say, you know, with with regards to putting up a gate, a, a, a fence, a fence is going to have to have a gate, and people are going to have to go in and out of the gate. So, just putting a fence up is, is really going to be counter, not really productive, because students are going to have to go through that gate. Um, as Mr. Pender said, and I'm, and I'm fresh on the ground here, there's some different models that we're going to look at. Um, I can tell you in the, the high schools that I've been to and some of the other schools that I've been to already over the last couple of weeks, that's the top priority. The SROs that I've met with at these schools have all emailed me with their lists of concerns that they have too. And they're very similar to the concerns that probably some of you have too. And, and what I can tell you is, is, is that we're going to take a, a good look at everything. Um, and try to make some recommendations to improve safety to keep these kids safe. Uh, the portables are, are, are not ideal, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do our best to make sure that we have some safe options for these kids. And if you wanna leave your contact information with Carrie, one of us, I'd be happy to reach back out with you. Um, If they, um, my, my boys, because we have some military background, mm -hmm. um, my boys were more to the like, not a problem. If we, if he enters, we're getting them. Um, mm -hmm. um, but my daughter is like, yeah, that's not how that works in a portable because it's kind of tight. Like she has a, it's a very large math class. It's, it's just how it works. And, um, but like, she's like, it's too tight a space to say six students on one and hope we get lucky if, why we're being a target and she's sure. like to know like what else is being looked at or done and that's okay. that's fine i appreciate yeah. it thank you i, appreciate and I just it. wanted to add one thing too we we all know that portables in and of themselves are not ideal i mean and that's because we just don't have the space in the building so i think a long range plan would be to try to resolve that issue and not have portables at all but that's going to be quite quite a ways down the road obviously um it takes a lot of money and it, it takes some planning but but ideally you wouldn't have that situation where you would have portables and some schools just can't avoid that so how do we um, make that as safe as possible knowing that that's not an ideal situation so appreciate the comments First, I want to say that during the COVID situation, I did not agree with any of the protocol that was brought down. But what I did notice is that you kept everyone out for a germ. So you should be able to do the same thing for shooters without alienating parents, grandparents, and the people that do need to be in there to care for our children. So if we can maybe, that's my suggestion. You were asking for suggestions. You locked out everybody. Without masking our children again, maybe we can just protect them. So I know that you can do that. I have faith that you can do that. And maybe we need to look at it a little more simplistically like that. So if all of that happened because of a germ, maybe we can do it because we don't want our children shot. Hi. Um, we have a first grader in one of the public schools in the county and we're thinking about what these lockdown drills entail. He doesn't know what school shootings are. It's not even on his radar. And so we have a concern, you know, but of course we want him to be safe in public school, but I'm also concerned about the effect on his mental health of what these lockdown drills could have. Um, I wanna know, is that part of your concern too? Can you tell me what it would entail to have these drills? How realistic are they? I know, you know, 
Some of the guidelines put out by American Academy of Pediatrics say that you should have mental health counseling available just after the drill um, because it can be traumatic. So I'd appreciate your comments on that. Yes, and thank you for asking that question. And certainly, as I said, part of our strategic plan is school safety, but it's also the wellness of our students. And we take that very seriously and have really um, looked at the social and emotional well-being of our students. As we do drills, um, we do them, like you said, by grade band. So we have elementary, middle, and high school, and we do approach them differently. Um, we uh, use age-appropriate vocabulary and and um, conversation almost with our students depending on what grade level they are. And that's honestly why we do bring in all of our partners because they tell us what we kind of need to do from the safety aspect of it or the response aspect of it. And then as educators, we are able to translate that appropriately per the age band. Um, but we are very aware of it. We know that um, you know, just in and of itself for us it's a very traumatic the, you know, the conversation in and of itself is very serious and heavy for us, and we, we don't want to make it a scary situation for our students. We want to make it a situation where we're building that skill set for them. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in. I, I would say, you know, talking with all the principals, and I've, I've witnessed quite a few of them, and I, I'm going to reference Centerville Elementary School over here. Ms. Farnell and her staff really Put a lot of time in that to thinking about hey you know we don't want to scare the students and not just the students but the staff also because the students can read what's going on with the staff you know if, if they're nervous so it's making it age appropriate to what's going on um, you know what happens at a high school is a lot different than what's at first grade um, and I, I'd say that was when we first started moving in this direction was a very big concern for the principals and you know also for us of how do you enforce it you know and do the training but keep it at an age appropriate level and there is a lot of thought that goes into that um, you know each school is a little bit different but like I said I you know for Miss Farnell she, she does a very good job with that and watching it so that the students aren't you know stressed out Is there anywhere that um, parents could access just what type of language, either to reinforce or just to, you know, discuss after a drill with them? Can we? Can the parents know? Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, what language is used and what is expected of them at an elementary level? Yes, I and I would say that any parent at any time can make an appointment with the administrative staff and that they would be happy to review that. Now, while we won't, um, in certain situations, give out information, like sometimes we've been asked of, you know, where are the resource officers on every given day? Where do they park? Um, what, what, what area do they cover? And that information we're not gonna share just because it could put us vulnerable um, to maybe somebody who doesn't need that information. But the administration is more than happy um, to sit down and conference with any parent as it relates to any concerns and can certainly share that information. While I don't think we have a list per se to give to a parent that says this is the language we use, I know that they'd be more than happy to um, sit and discuss any questions that you would have specifically to that, you know, developmentally speaking, age appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thanks. Um, I am a little concerned uh, with, uh, so I have two kids and they're very unique and they like to play video games, you know. Um, and some of them are a little bit violent and they, you know, they, they joke and laugh about shooting and, you know, I'm going to kill you and stuff. I'm a little bit worried about, like, overreaction. I also I recently divorced and had a custody battle and so I'm kind of worried that, like, if they do something like that on the bus, they're playing around like that, they're going to get reported, I'm going to get reported to CPS. Uh, what, I don't know, what measures are there to prevent uh, things from going out of control like that so we do get those allegations or those comments that are made quite often uh, amongst kids to other kids what the resource deputy is responsible for and will do um, is a home visit and speak to you um, they will go to the home they will talk to the parent they'll talk to um, the person who made the complaint if it's not um, if it's somebody who wants to be contacted and at that point in time, a lot of these issues are, are clarified and made very clear that there was no ill intent uh, with that conversation. But under my watch, anyone, any comment that is made will be looked into. Um, we do home visits all the time. 
99% of them are unsubstantiated. They, they end up being nothing at all other than miscommunication or words that shouldn't have been said. Perfectly fine. We know kids are going to be kids. We're not, you know, handcuffing them, throwing, you know, or anything like that. The one thing we want to do, though, is make sure that if we do get something like that said, that we do fully investigate that risk. Um, and we're going to communicate with the school. Uh, there's a lot of factors I'm sure they look into as far as behavior, mental health, and things like that. Um, but we'll do a home visit. We'll ask the, the parents, hey, do you have access? Does the kid have access to firearms? Uh, what, what's available? Whether the parent notices anything that's going on uh, with their child. Most of the time, it's unfounded. Our deputies have been out at 9, 10, 10 o'clock at night for these visits, and um, we'll make sure we do. But 99% of the time, they're unfounded. Does that help at all? Hi, I have a few questions, so they're mostly like really quick. Um, I feel like as a parent, it would be helpful to know what is being done at the schools. Like somebody had said the counseling and things like that, but like, do you guys have certain locks on every doors? Is there a school resource officer at every single school? I don't need to know where the officer is. I don't feel like that's what we need to know but I don't even know if there's one officer designated for my daughter's school. Um, so is there any way you guys, like, as a Board of Ed, could put that out for each school system for parents at the beginning of the year, like the back to school night, hey, this is what's being done, these are the locks we have on each door, like, you know, that kind of information. Um, and then I personally have a daughter who is special needs. She is nonverbal, not able to walk. I was asked last year on the day of the active shooter drill to bring her in late because of staffing, that they didn't have enough staff to get her out that day. As a parent, I was like, uh, no, she's coming today because I feel like this is the day you need her here to figure out how you're gonna get her out. Um, so that is a huge concern of mine, like the staffing shortage. I constantly hear we're short staffed, we're short staffed. I know that everyone is short staffed right now, but what are we doing to get higher caliber people even in the school? Like our aides are paid awful amount of money and I know that's statewide, countrywide, but that's a huge concern too. Um, so I, I wanna give you a chance to answer before I rebuttal again. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I totally agree that having the uh, SRO there on back to school nights so parents can meet them is a great idea. Um, we will not disclose on, you know, the location of the SROs. Um, understandably that there's probably, I mean, this is a pretty trusted group here, but there are also people that are out there that are trying to find information out about our school district to make us a victim of an incident. Um, I would, if you go to your office of the school, uh, they can let you meet the SRO that's assigned to that school. I would have no problem with that at all. Um, I do want to thank our county commissioners. They have funded five additional positions for school resource officers, um, which is coming up. Um, I want to thank them personally for that. Our community should as well. Um, so all of our schools are covered in the county, and uh, we will make sure that, um, as far as, I, I made a lot of notes here. You know, one of the things I, I don't think it's important, and, uh, and Joseph Roy can probably add to this, but talking about the locks and which doors, I think that, the parents need to still use the, and only use the entrance that's provided um, for screening purposes, whether it's a parent, grandparent, or whoever it may be um, in that school area. But taking your back to school night thing, I took notes on that, and next year you'll see your deputy at the back to school night too. Okay. Chief Joyner. That's okay, yeah. I'd like to address the staffing piece yeah. of things. Um, and I do think that certainly in education as a whole, staffing has been a concern. Um, and that support role is even more of a concern. So while we're fully staffed for our certified teachers, sometimes we lag on getting all of those positions filled. And we are creating um, opportunities within our district to what we consider grow your own. And we're working with um, a grant that we wrote called the Maryland Leads Grant to provide funding for um, people to be able to advance themselves in their degrees or to get a degree to be able to be employed with us, whether that's an AA degree or whatnot. Um, so we are trying some different strategies for recruitment and retention, um, but certainly that um, experience that you had should not have happened and certainly something that I will follow up with as well. Um, all of our students need to be in school every day, um, regardless of what opportunities we're doing, whether that be participating in a pep rally or 
participating in a lockdown drill. Everyone needs to be there so that we can all be um, on, our, on our best if we have to utilize one of those strategies. So um, I apologize for that experience and certainly we'll be looking into it. But we are working to try to um, make sure that we have the best and brightest staff members for our students. Um, I appreciate that. So I know like a lot of this is like we're working on it, we're going to get to that. Are we following up like in three months with something like this, like a similar meeting where par parents can come and the community can say like what progress have we made? Because I feel like that's where we fall short in a lot of things in life is like, oh, we're working on it, we're going to get there, but then there's no follow through. So it's like, I feel like this is something, these are our most precious gifts. Like we need to be protecting them and we need, more parents need to be here tonight. So. Yes, and um, absolutely, we're happy to follow up and do something maybe early spring before we get geared up into parents having so many activities, you know, after school with nicer weather. Um, so we're happy to do that. But I would strongly encourage you that if you have a question at any time, regardless of what it is, um, at the school-based level, reach out to your administrators or your teacher and then your administrators. Um, if you feel like you haven't really gotten the answer that you need, um, we, you know, call the central office, whether that be to um, school safety, if, you know, if it's specifically a school safety question, if you have a curricular question, we have an assistant superintendent, Dr. Marcia Sprankle, and certainly you can contact my office. So, and I can get you where you need to go or help you. Um, but I, I wanna make sure that parents understand that, you know, you're always welcome to ask questions. We are transparent. You know, if we can't tell you, we're gonna tell you that we can't tell you and why we can't tell you, um, but we're here to, to partner with our families. That's the only way that our students are gonna be successful is if we partner together. And really, that's the biggest message tonight that we want to bring to our community. As you see, this, this collaborative approach up here, um, this is how important it is to us. Uh, and there's never a second that I can't call Sheriff and he doesn't pick up or he calls me and I don't pick up. That's the relationship that we have. Emergency services, the town, you know what I mean? So that, that's one of the purposes for tonight is to show that partnership. Hi, I know that we're talking a lot about the public schools, but I was just also wondering, um, have you guys had any conversations with the private schools in the area? Because I know that um, there's a few and that, kind of, that works differently. So we, we have talked to and we do um, have deputies that check on and work with the private schools. Um, that'll be the extent that I'll relay on that part. Um, but most of our private schools are very familiar with our staff. Um, we've got a great working relationship with them. And um, I think that they feel you know as secure as, as the rest of the school system feels. I mean, they're vulnerable as well as anything. Um, so they're definitely uh, part of our plan and part of our patrols as far as that goes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, my sincerest gratitude to local law enforcement for being here. Um, uh, Mr. Sabery, I hope they don't get rid of your position. I hope they don't defund you. Um, that position needs to be kept. Um, so all my comments, don't take them as you as I, I believe you're two or three weeks in. The problem is not with local law enforcement. The problem's not with law enforcement. How do we keep these bad guys out of our schools, right? If I leave my door open and someone comes in and kills me, am I gonna blame the sheriff's department for how long it takes them to get there? No, that's my fault for leaving the door open, right? But it's a school problem. The school needs to fix it. Talked about the portables. Those need to go, we call them temporaries. They're not temporaries, they're permanents. They've been there for years. They don't leave, they stay. They need to go. 1764, first documented school shooting. Predates America's independence. That's how long this has been going on for. April 20th, 1999, that's the first one I'll remember. Columbine, I remember that one. Everything's happened a lot since then, but I remember that. All we do is, when it happens, we talk about it for a while, and then it disappears. The only thing that's progressed is how many times it's happened, because it continues to happen more and more and more. There needs to be more security within these schools. We don't need to just keep talking about it. It needs to be done. This talking, action speed a lot louder than words, and that's what we need to do. 1918, Spanish flu, right? 
2020, COVID, we spent millions and millions and billions of dollars on that. It's happened once in 100 years. This has been happening since before independence. But yet, we're not addressing the problem. But we'll, we'll address it with COVID. We'll lock down the schools. We'll keep all the kids out. But we won't try to fix it for school shootings. And it's not just school shootings. Kids assaulting other kids and staying in the school. You know, um, the counterpart over here, she said she was at a school. Both my kids go to that school, right? So my kids have a long time in this uh, county's public schools that I have to deal with. Stuff like that shouldn't be happening, and it doesn't rest on the sheriff. It rests on the county public schools. It does not rest on local law enforcement. They're there to stop the damage that the schools didn't stop. You look at a lot of these school shootings, shooters just walk in the door. That shouldn't happen. People shouldn't just be walking in the door for any reason. There's a lot of things that could be done. You know, I've worked in public safety for 17 years. There's a lot of things that can be done to keep our kids safe. Thank you for your comments. And um, I certainly agree with you that if I've learned anything in my career, that it is how do we keep the bad guys out? And that is um, by making sure that all of our doors are secure. Um, and we say that over and over and over again to staff and have let them know that if we tell you that your door was open and we find it out open again, then we need to follow up with that through our HR department because it's, that's how important it is. We've also um, talked with staff and talked to them about the badges and make sure that um, that if they don't see a person, if they see a person in the school building that doesn't have a badge on it, we've helped talk them through what does that scenario look like and how do you approach that person and help them to get where they need to go. As it relates to anyone walking in the door, we do have a strict policy that you have to buzz in to get in. Um, the secretary or the receptionist that's at the building will respond to the person by inquiring who they are and why they're there. Those are their two questions they have to ask. Um, and then they obviously are buzzed in if that they have appropriate business there. Um, I, I, I agree with you that it's not just the sheriff's to, you know, problem or concern or whatnot, but that's why we partner together, um, being in education and then having the expertise to be able to ask the sheriff to help us as it relates to how do we secure our buildings and make sure that, that we are doing everything that we can to keep that bad person out. Um, we talked about the portables already. I'm trying to remember everything you talked about, but we did talk about the portables. You're right. Um, it's unfortunate that they're there. We have to deal with that. We don't have the funding to build an additional building there. Um, eventually, hopefully, as I stated before, that we would get rid of those. I mean, that would ideally would be the best case scenario, but we also have to seek funding to be able to do that. Just a real quick response on, on the locked doors. So the teachers get in trouble if they don't lock the door, correct? Is there anything stopping a shooter from breaking open that door? No, there's not. There's stuff that can be done. There's doors that can be bought. There's bolts that can be done so those teachers are safe, so those kids are safe. So maintenance workers, cafeteria staff, counselors, right, office staff. That's, that's what we should be worrying about, but if we say, well, yeah, you're supposed to shut the door, but anyone can break it open. You know, yeah, I get active shooters. They try to go to the easiest spot, right? They do that. They're going to try to go to the easiest spot. But when they run out of the easiest spot, if all I got to do is shoot open a little glass window and unlock that door just to open it up, it's not that hard. So, again, we can, we can push off the blame to someone other than the school, the administration of the school. But we need, and again, ask for funding, COVID. We asked for funding, we got it. But now we're just saying, well, we have to ask for funding. It wasn't a problem when we had COVID, but now it's a problem again. We have to ask for funding. The doors should be secured, yes, but they should also be reinforced. These windows outside, they should be reinforced because some of these windows in these schools are just like we talked about Swiss cheese, they're gonna blow right through all those windows. I don't want my kids to die. They don't want their kids to die, you know? There's a lot of stuff that goes on that we can't keep blaming people at the lower level because it starts at the top. The top has to make the decisions. The top has to get the funding, not continue to say we're going to ask for it. Get it. 
the school system gets roughly 50% of the county budget. You can run all these services, everything in the county on half a budget, but we're asking for funding to reinforce our doors in the schools. We're asking for funding to get rid of temporaries because they're not temporaries, they're permanent. There's funding there. Maybe it needs to be reallocated. Maybe we need to stop the, uh, well, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I guarantee you that happens. Mr. Joe, you mentioned the, uh, the bus drivers being a great resource. I hadn't even really thought about that, but I'm just curious. Do they do any special training? Um, just to be more aware, I don't mean to, I'm sure they're very aware, but do they do any training together and that is that that LLCs as well as our bus drivers? Or, but that, that's a great resource. I'm just wondering if they get extra training. No, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think in fact, over the last, three years the, the bus drivers have received uh, two different training sessions and the training that they receive is specific to bus drivers and that is uh, reporting suspicious activity at bus stops all the way to if something were to happen on the bus so it's a really comprehensive training for them um, and that's something that we're going to continue to do uh, as we move forward and we realize or at least I realize I'm not going to speak for everybody up here that a lot of this stuff isn't one size fits all what works at one school isn't going to work at another because there's just different there's so many different variables and what works in one classroom isn't going to work on another uh, and I'm all about making these schools more safe and more secure but the bottom line is that they weren't designed that way and they weren't built that way and we're left with the tough task now of how we're going to secure these schools against these types of threats and that stuff comes with a price tag uh, and i can tell you i was brought here for a reason to go around to look around and to listen to people and talk to people at different schools because what works at churchill elementary school might not work down at mattapeak middle so we got to find some common ground and find out what's, what works to keep these kids safe. And you're absolutely right. We need to find some funding to fix some of these problems. So I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure that I, that I bring these ideas back to my bosses and work collaboratively with our law enforcement partners to try to fix some of these issues. Because it's a problem. And nobody wants to be the person without a chair when the music stops. And I certainly don't want to be on national news with a candlelight vigil. So if there's things that we can do to work together and encourage better relationships with our teachers and our students and our administrators and our law enforcement and our community to fix this, then that's what we need to do. And just to add one thing about funding in and of itself, they um, had school safety grants that we have always applied for always received whatever the maximum amount and spent every penny of it. Um, and Mr. Pender may want to go into some detail of what some of those funds have been used for. But um, when COVID hit, those funds went away. And uh, we are hopeful that those funds will return and that we would continue to apply for those funds, get those funds, and do um, enhancements to our buildings to better secure them. So, I'm sorry. So, yeah, the Maryland Center for School Safety, most of, some of those are grants that um, you don't have to have any matching funds. Um, and some of the items that we've used for the other ones that become IEC, the Maryland Construction Program at schools, we've used that funding to do the single point entries. You know, again, we can only do about two a year based upon the funding that we receive. The, um, other funding that is like one time, we were able to purchase um, Stop the Bleeding kits for every single classroom um, to put in there. So we have, when COVID hit, a lot of that funding dried up. And it's unfortunate because somebody said in here earlier, people react after there's an incident. You know, so you really didn't hear much about the funding part of it until Texas happened. And then all of a sudden, 
you know, they gear it back up where it should be something that is year round every single year allocated for that. Um, you know, but those are the areas that we have used the funding for. And and one other comment going back to what Joe said that our our buildings weren't built for that. Our average buildings in Queen Anne's County Public Schools is 51 years. So if you think back um, a significant period of time ago, this wasn't a concern when our buildings were being built. And as we move forward in building um, new buildings, this obviously is going to be a priority as well. Hi, I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, share some appreciation as an elementary school principal in the district. So in, in my 26 years in education, I've worked in two different districts. And in Queen Anne's County, what I have found is we have made steady progress over the years with the steps that are being taken to protect all of our children. It is taken very seriously by everyone. And something that not all of you may be aware of is that as a staff, we have participated countywide in active shooter trainings, stop the bleed trainings. These are something that when we went into education, we never thought we would face, but we understand the seriousness of school safety. And I can tell you that everyone at that table is working hand in hand with all of the administrators to make sure that our staff is prepared when or if that would ever happen. So kudos to all of you, and I am very grateful for the partnership and for the trainings that you have provided, especially in this past year. So thank you. I have, I have a question in regards to um, changing, changing the topic. Um, this whole um, fentanyl and overdose and we've gone purple and we've got all our pretty banners and stuff up. Um, I have a question in concerns to um, the Narcam that can be used in case of a real emergency. Are those something that like the nurse's office at the schools have or we have to call 911 and hope you're getting there fast enough? Is that something as parents who show up to regular games like I'm kind of there all the time because my kids in activities is that something that like do you have to receive a training in order to get one to be carrying it or I buy it somewhere or so, how does that work um, I know the schools are supposed to be drug free alcohol free and all that we also know that teenagers have their own mind so good luck with that I know that when the canines walk through the school sometimes y'all find stuff okay um, but how does that work with the fentanyl thing going on, like on the news, like, you know, it really looks like candy now than like a pill that like, why are you taking a pill not through the nurse's office? Yeah. Um, do we have, what do we have? So th there is Narcan in, in every single school that's allocated there. there. And there is a training and it's very brief and very easy. Um, and the administrators are trained for that as well. Um, and as it relates to, um, you know, looking at it as like candy that you described, um, we have certain curricular um, spots in our curriculum that we review types of things like that and talk about not only drugs but different types of drugs and what they're used for and what are not good for you and those types of things. So that's infused within, it's mandatory, infused within our Maryland curriculum that we do. We, and just for a little plug on that too, we do have a new program starting with um, student ambassadors as it relates to Queen Anne's County Goes Purple. Those ambassadors will be meeting um, throughout the school year to continue to do activities with students to not just focus on the month of September, but to continue that awareness and building awareness throughout. Um, we do have a grant that funds, um, funds that to be able. That they collect their candy and then you see this candy in their lunches for I, I guess till Christmas or Valentine's Day whatever um, that like h how would you know if you got real candy or we have an incident that needs a Narcam check why we undo it okay yeah uh, I'm, I'm fine thank you I appreciate it so in addition to the nurses and school staff having access to Narcan the deputies at the schools also have Narcan they have uh, courtesy of DES they have an AED as well um, so they've done a lot of a lot to on the preventative side to ensure that you know the response is minimal to that as far as the Halloween safety and all that I mean one of the things that we're 
talking to everybody about and getting ready to gear up with is just being aware of what your children are eating and consuming and who they're getting it from. Um, we haven't seen, you know, th that the colored fentanyl yet, but you're seeing it's coming across the border. Uh, it's coming into different communities. It's recently just found in Pennsylvania. So it's one of those things that um, we really need to make our whole community aware of that uh, those things are out there. So thank you for bringing that up. Welcome. I, I was just going to say, we always used to say, when in doubt, throw it out for Halloween. Yeah, well, At a risk of spending too much time off topic, um, there are a lot of things that we've been working on in the background for several years, pre-COVID, post-COVID. Um, and as the sheriff mentioned, uh, we've been working with the health department to make sure that the Narcan is distributed to deputies, um, all of our local law enforcement, that we have training on that on a regular basis. Um, we work with the health department to make that happen. Um, so there are more partners for more events than just this, um, than what's sitting at the table. So I wanna make sure that, that they're represented as well. We've also worked um, to make sure that we have AEDs in, in all of our schools and the Stop the Bleed kits. So you'll notice even in this room, um, we provide them for the county buildings, we provide them for, um, for the school system. We work to make sure that there is, um, in addition to prevention, but there's also adequate response mechanisms and make sure the staff is trained. So uh, my first question is for Sheriff Hoffman. So you did say all our schools will have an SRO now. We're not sharing all anymore. Of, all of our school, well, and that, if you want to see me after, I'll give you, I'm, I'll talk to you about the operational plan, but I'm not going to put that on QAC TV. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that we're jeopardizing the safety of all of our kids. Well, we're not sharing. Yeah, we d are we sharing? Like, are is the person in Southersville, you know, going to have to go up to Churchill? Absolutely or? not. Okay. Nope. What was that? I got. What? I can assure you that Bayside does not share with Madison. No, Bayside does not. Do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to put this out there for everybody on QAC TV? I think it would help because if I was an active shooter, I wouldn't want to know that all our schools have an officer there. I mean, you're not saying who the officer is. Are they? We just want to know are all the schools all the schools are covered. equipped. All the, all of I'm, our I'm schools are and I encourage you if if once we finish, if you would like to stay, uh, we'd be happy to further this discussion. Yeah, you know, all of our schools are covered. I mean, I'm very confident in our schools. I'm confident in the resource officers that have those schools and the amount of coverage that they're providing. Plus, we have five additional ones coming on board. All right, well, that's good. I think that's what everybody wants to know. Do sure. we have, we just, you know, the sharing thing is not working. If you have to drive five minutes up the road, that's, it's there, pointless. There's not one school that has a response time of more than one minute. All right. Okay. Um, my next question is, so, um, since we were talking about doors before with everybody, um, my husband's a state trooper, so he does school site checks all the time. and all it, it seems like it's all the time there's always open doors and you know they're like oh do you want to come in do a school safety check no he'll just walk around let me see well he lets himself in because lo and behold we as parents we go to the front door we get buzzed in he walks around and he finds an open door because it's either got a chair in it a rug got stuck in it um, and back to what Chris said, we, we can't have that happen anymore. There needs to be a beeper, a buzzer, something to let them know, hey, there's a door open because if I'm a bad guy, I'm not gonna go ring the bell. I'm just gonna go walk around the school and walk on right in the door like as what's happened repeatedly. Um, my next question is, um, how does MSP and the sheriff of office work together? So when MSP does school safety checks and they find something, even he doesn't know what's the process of with the logs, like what happens to them? Do they come to you guys? All right, well, she's gonna take I was gonna take your door question. Door okay. I, think, I think we already addressed it earlier in the conversation this evening, but um, as stated to all of our employees on our kickoff, where our sheriff was there in person to provide some professional development, um, staff was put on notice that if, they, if, if there's multiple attempts, it goes to HR, which becomes a disciplinary 
um, issue for them. So we are addressing it. We do think that it's definitely been a problem in the past, and this year, out of the gate, we have been on it, and I have honestly not heard. Before um, last year, we would get pictures from staff members and such and have to address it that way. This year, we haven't got, I have not personally gotten anything. So I think that the staff has heard us and understands us, but we're not perfect, and we're going to continue to work on it. So the, uh, the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Office and Senator Barrick work very well together. Um, and they do share information. Obviously, the, like any law enforcement agency, MSP is understaffed as well as the Office of the Sheriff is. Um, you know, but there is an exchange every day of different emails and things back and forth on school safety. Everything now is going to be coordinated through uh, Joe Sabori to better make sure that information goes out. But recently, there was an issue involving something at the school and I can tell you that the email chain that went out by the school was very comprehensive with all the law enforcement agencies, Centerville Police Department, Sheriff's Office and MSP. So I think the information sharing is good. Um, I think it's improved a lot uh, recently and um, I would hope that if he does see a door open that he does get a picture of it. Is he doing Centerville, I mean, Queen Anne's County Schools? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would hope he reports it immediately to the staff that's there, but we haven't heard of anything being reported to us that I'm aware of. I don't so, know if this is recently. I know it was, you know, last, last year. And last year it, yeah, it could be in the past, but I haven't heard anything recently. Especially with COVID last year, I think teachers were trying to open their doors and windows um, in an attempt to, you know, get air circulating and such. So I think that was something that in that moment, because of this, the COVID, I think, yeah. it, I think that's how it kind of got way skewed to the other side. Mm -hmm. But out of the gate this year, we have been very hard on it. And not, we would definitely appreciate anybody reporting anything immediately so we can handle it. Okay. Yeah, it was just more back to what Chris said. I mean, mistakes happen. People leave doors open. Rugs get caught in doors. But, you know, if that door is left open, there should be, I mean, something simple as a buzzer, a sensor. Hey, the door's open. Somebody come shut it before somebody just walks in. So thank you. I kind of want to piggyback on what she was saying as far as the doors go. I, I feel like when you say like to an, uh, a, a teacher, hey, if you leave that door open two times, you're going to HR, they're going to start looking out for each other. Oh, I saw that door open, but I'm not going to report it because I don't want such and such to get fired. Like, I guess I just don't feel like that's a good approach to it. I feel like, like she said, if there's a sensor on a door that alarms if it's left open, that's a really cheap fix. Like I have those on my windows from Amazon, they're cheap. Could you guys come up as a board of ed and say, this is how much it would cost to put on every single window and every single door and email it out to the parents? I guarantee you people would be willing to throw money at you to put those, like, those sensors on doors and windows. As a parent, I know I certainly would. So. A slap on a wrist saying to a teacher, if this happens, if you leave a door open two times, you're going to HR, I guarantee you they're going to start watching out for each other and you're not going to get reports this year. They're not going to be, like a teacher's not going to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to report my friend for doing that. I just, I don't feel like that's a good approach to it. I'm sorry if I'm the only one, but I just don't feel like that's a good solution. Well, I, I do appreciate your comments, but I also know that we are professionals in our business and that when there's an expectation that you should follow that expectation. I certainly think in this situation that I would really hope that a teacher understands that, the, that school security and safety is in check right now or in, in the play so that they wouldn't, you know, to, hopefully they would go and say, hey, you need to close your door instead of, you know, if, in that aspect of things. But I, I really think that it needs to be handled in a, in a situation that's very serious um, for, as I said, we're all professionals. Um, you know, we're telling you not to open your door. You shouldn't prop your door open for any reason. That's my expectation. And I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Um, as it relates to, to putting devices on all of the um, um, doors and windows, I, I mean, I don't know about that. That would be something that Joe, I guess, I, I'm not sure I, we can investigate that to see if there's any product out there. Um, we also have to remember that our schools are not like our homes. Um, our, our schools are, um, you know, just in and of a, a day, like today at Queen Anne's County High School, going through those front doors, you have those doors opening and closing thousands of times as students come in and out, um, the wear and tear. So I don't know if, if something that would be appropriate for home would necessarily work for the school, so we'd have to investigate that. But I, I do appreciate the uh, recommendation, and we certainly can look into that. Hi again. 
Um, since we're talking about locked doors, I, I would suggest this, and I, I do have a lot of suggestions, but I won't leave them all here today. Um, the only time, in my opinion, that the doors in those schools should be open, like the classroom doors, is during class change. Only time. Other than that, they should be locked. The only time parents, including myself, any other parent in here, should be allowed into that school is not during school change. Anytime anyone is allowed in that school, should not be during school. When you're switching classes, no one should be allowed in that school. If you're coming to pick up your kid or you're coming to identify whatever you need to identify, doesn't matter who you are, delivery, who cares? Only time those doors should be open to let someone in the office to say, yeah, you can get your kid, is once the class change is done, which I'm sure takes 10, 15 minutes, then maybe address that. But if they, they can sit outside, I can sit outside. I don't have a problem with that. If it's for the safety and security uh, for, the, for the school, I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think anyone else should have a problem with that. Um, but as far as like the alarms on the doors, really the, uh, the doors that should have the alarms are really all of your egress doors, all of your exit doors. Those, those should have the alarms on them, not like the little classroom doors. All the exit doors that people should not be going in and out of. Doesn't matter what time of the day it is, unless it's an emergency because there's a fire or something like that. Those are the doors that should have alarms on them so that we're not opening them for any reason. So that, that's my opinion on locked doors, and you're not addressing every single door in that school. It's just certain doors that need to be addressed because that's where someone's going to walk in at. So the question is, um, I, these are different glasses, sorry. Can you borrow my contacts? Yeah. What are you doing to address students who have special needs during an active assailant event? And what I would say to that is that um, it depends on when you say special needs, we have a variety of students with special needs and some students um, are extremely highly functioning and, and, and have been through the, the drills or whatever and would follow through with whatever they need to just like their peers. Um, if we have a student who is maybe wheelchair, wheelchair um, bound, then we do have a plan of action that's actually in their IEP. We work with the parent and the IEP team to create a plan of action. Um, many of those students do have a one-on-one. -on -one, um, Right, and I, I do know that um, I did address that before and said that that wasn't correct. You're, you're right, right, that, that if, wasn't. If you have a plan, then it right. should be available to her mother to know what that plan is. Correct. All right. I, I agree. We also have um, special um, chairs to help move since, because usually in um, an emergency situation, you can't always use an elevator, so we have special chairs for that. Um, and even in each school, um, just like Joe said, every school is different. What works in one school doesn't work in another. So in some schools, we've had to create um, a hardscape, is what we call it, to have that access point to, to get out of the school, and like, because grass may be a challenge or the scape may be a challenge. Um, so every student, basically, the IEP team looks at that and determines uh, what the need is and uh, what you would need to do in, in case of an emergency. And if at any time a parent has a concern or at any time a parent has a question about what the school would do in a case of emergency for their child who has special needs, I strongly encourage them to reach out to their, either their teacher, their special education teacher, or to their administrative staff who would be happy to sit with them and talk to them about what their plans are in case there was an emergency with their individual child who has needs. So I think that's all of our questions for tonight right here. But I, again, um, we have these cards. Feel free if you have additional um, questions for us. Uh, there's a sign-in, I believe, that has everybody's contact so that when we do get all of our questions um, out and all of our answers out, that we can email it out to a list and we can just continue to build on that list as we get additional questions um, and send that out. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming out. We really appreciate the opportunity. It's, it, you know, um, it's, it's, an ex it's an exposure point for us that we come out here and expose ourselves. And that I think, I hope that you take that as um, we are transparent. We do want to hear from the community. Um, we're not perfect. 
and we know we're not perfect. Um, what can we do to be better? And that's really what we're trying to do is to just be better together because um, we are better together, right? And so I thank you so much for coming out. We certainly will schedule another one in the spring, in the early spring. Um, uh, we'll try to do the same time, the same place, so that it's nice and easy for everyone. Um, and again, anytime you have any additional questions between now and then, please don't hesitate to reach out. I want to thank everybody. Um, and I know that we want to be you know, transparent. That's why we're sitting here. That's why nobody asked us to do this. It's something we sat up here and, and decided to do because we wanted the input from the community. The input that you've provided is very valuable to us. Uh, we do appreciate um, the comments, the concerns, the suggestions that were made. Um, I took copious notes. I noted who up here responded to what so that we can do follow up on our end as well. Um, you know, I, w I want to assure you, and I'm very confident in the staff that's up here and, and very confident in the teachers that are there now, uh, the school resource deputies that are working those, the allied agencies that also do the checks during the day, um, Centerville Police Department, the Maryland State Police, um, all very qualified, all very dedicated to the same thing that every one of us is in this room for, making sure that our children are safe and that they come home and that we keep the bad guys and girls out of our schools. And I truly want to just thank all of you for coming out tonight, being here, giving us your thoughts, your suggestions, your ideas, your criticisms, whatever it may have been, because um, it, it helps us better what we're doing. And that's my two cents. Um, I can only repeat what the sheriff has said. I appreciate um, your questions, your concerns. If there's anything we can do, um, to coordinate between the agencies um, it is what we're here to do um, so we have made strides within the school system getting our paramedics in the school system um, they're doing teaching they're making contacts within all of which um, we haven't done since before covid so i truly can say that this group is working together better than it has um, in my tenure um, with the department so we really are making strides to try to make that happen. As I hear you, I have children in the school. Is it happening fast enough? Um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that we can, we can do what is common sense and cheap now, um, that what makes sense just putting our heads together and then making plans for the future to make sure that things are hardened as we continue forward. Yeah, thanks again for, for the opportunity to, to listen um, and to learn. Um, and, and again, what, what I would say is let's not wait. Uh, if there's a problem, if you see something, if you've got a concern, you know, uh, let's not wait until the spring to, to talk about what we saw in September that was maybe unsafe, a door left open. If you've got a concern, report it right away. Report it to somebody that's going to listen to you. Ask to speak to the school principal call up to the Board of Education and ask to speak with me or the superintendent or Mr. Pender. Don't wait, right? If there's things that are broken, we gotta fix them right away. If there's things that we can control, we need to take control of them and get them taken care of. So I would encourage everybody here to, uh, you know, let's, let's try to work together to fix some of these problems. There's some things that we can fix right away. There's some things that are gonna, gonna take a little bit of time, but I can tell you, you know, I've known this group up here for quite some time and uh, we do have a solid foundation in place here, and, and we're going we're gonna to work our tails off to make sure that our kids are safe, mine and yours. Just <clears throat> piggybacking on what everybody said, the suggestions that were given tonight are greatly appreciated, and there are items that we need to really sit down and address. And I, I wanna, you were talked about funding for Mr. Sabori's position. Um, that was one position that we knew we needed and that was created. Um, we had a very talented group of people that interviewed for it, and Mr. Sabori was chosen. But that is a permanent position within, you know, it's not a grant, it will be something that's here to stay. And, you know, it's something the superintendent and the sheriff, everybody here feels very strongly about, because it, that is a full-time job, and it needs to be dedicated to it. Um, you know, I was stretched so thin trying to cover everything. But, you know, again, with having Mr. Sabori here, that gives that one person to sit there and pay attention to all the needs. So, thank you. No pressure. Right? 
I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Uh, we greatly appreciate your, your comments and your concerns. Um, the cards that are sitting on the uh, chairs, take a few minutes to fill those out. You know, will you fill it out now and, uh, you know, give it to the sheriff or one of the members of his staff or you take the time to uh, email your concern to uh, one of the people up here. I'd encourage you to, um, in the spring when we do a follow-up, please take the time to invite your neighbors or your friends or your family. The more input that we have from you, the uh, better prepared our schools will be and the better prepared uh, you, you know, we'll be, the more we will be available to help you. Um, if you see something, take the time to report it. Even if it seems like nothing, it may be something. We'd, we'd much rather you do that than do nothing at all. Um, and like we all said earlier, you know, anything you report, you can remain anonymous on. Um, you know, we're here to help you. We, we appreciate your help as well. Thanks for coming out this evening.